Hello and welcome back to my interview with Grant Fitzwilliam, who is co-founder and managing director at 3C Insight. Today we're going to be at part four of our conversation on KPIs. In particular today we'll be looking at record to report KPIs. So I'll kick off with my first question. Looking specifically at record to report KPIs, Grant, what are the three essential must-have KPIs within this process? Uh, I think first a general comment, Susie, and that is that in the record to report, you're typically looking at less measures than in the other areas, such as procure to pay. But the top three that we like to see in place are days to close. In other words, how long is it taking to close the general ledger completely? Number two is what's the percentage of manual journal entries? And third, it's looking at the growth rate or consistency in your chart of accounts. So a couple of components you can look at is how your accounts are growing over time and how your departments or cost centers are growing over time. Typically, if you've got a lot of growth, then that's going to cause complexity, not only in closing, but people booking transactions to the right chart of accounts values as well as then increasing the complexity of reporting when you've got increasing number of columns, if you will, or, or subsections of your overall income statement and balance sheet. Thank you for those. Three very, very useful ones there, which I know will, will help the audience. In your experience, Grant, are there any surprising ones that you find your clients typically overlook, but really, really they shouldn't be overlooking them? Well, a couple of things. Number one is we like to make it consistent with how you're measuring close. So we've, we've talked about that as being one of the key measures, but how you measure it. And there's different ways, but one airtight method to avoid any kind of manipulation or massaging of when the close date was is to look at when you booked your last journal entry for the period. And by keeping track of that, there's no um, issues with then knowing when you actually close the books. And we've seen examples where clients thought they closed the books a lot earlier than they actually did. Now, some of these, I'll call it late coming journal entries, may have been to reclassify dollars or move uh, expenses around for allocations. But the bottom line is we've seen examples where entries are still being booked and the client controller or CFO believes that the books are closed, which is never a good thing. So keeping track of it by the last journal entry is important. Mm -hmm. And then the second component is, again, I mentioned this in previous segments of our discussion, Susie, and that is segmenting manual journal entries. Mm -hmm. So we like to see them segmented into different buckets. For example, those that are estimates, like accrual entries, those that are automatable, and those that can be eliminated, i.e. small journal entries that are immaterial on an aggregate basis. Grant, you talked in your earlier response, and I wouldn't mind just teasing that out a little bit, about one KPI really should be around the kind of growth in the chart of accounts. Could you just build on that a little bit, please? Sure. When you're a growing company or you're um, a company that operates in a lot of different regions in the world, having inconsistent charts of accounts can cause issues in various parts of the organization. For example, if you have a proliferation of cost centers or a proliferation of general ledger accounts, think about how difficult that is for folks in procurement or accounts payable to know where to book invoices and charge them correctly because if you're adding them all the time and you used to be able to book it to a certain place and now there's a new one, well, do I book it to the old one, to the new one, um, what happens? Um, all of that creates confusion if you're starting to add a lot of accounts and cost centers over time. So if you need to add new ones, then you should counterbalance that with closing down or disabling ones that you are no longer using just to avoid people booking transactions either in the subledges or from a journal entry perspective to the wrong place. And by doing that, you reduce the possibility that at the end of the day, the general ledger accountants have to book reclassification entries to move costs around, for example, from one account or cost center to another because it was booked incorrectly in the first place. So who should be involved in building the KPI set and whom should the KPI set actually be reported to? 
Well, this is the most straightforward area of the ones we've covered, Susie, just because it's more accounting department, finance department focused. So really, just having the controller and the corporate controller and the CFO involved should be sufficient to make sure that you're measuring the right KPIs. It's not a broader audience like some of the other areas where you need to be in the business or um, some other potential um, areas within the company. It's pretty straightforward from a report to report standpoint. And what about the shared services director's role in the build and the reporting of the information or the information being reported to you? What's their role in all of that? Yes, I'm assuming that the shared services center is involved in all of the KPI negotiations. The folks I just highlighted were the ones that are outside of the shared services organization that need to be involved in defining and therefore buying into what the actual KPIs are that are being reviewed on a periodic basis. Could you provide an example of KPIs that are driving certain behaviors and improvements within record to report? Sure. And one thing I would suggest in addition to KPIs that help drive improvement is having the right forum. And the best companies that I've seen that have a good record to report process and a very fast close is companies that have a regimented set of meetings to perform a close post-mortem. In other words, after every close, it might not be monthly, but it's definitely quarterly, as most public companies have to have earnings announcements and guidance, etc., is to have that quarterly post-mortem to review exactly what happened and what are the improvements and what was supposed to be improved based on the last meeting. So that is always something that I see as the best practice with reviewing KPIs for the close process that should happen. And as part of that, as I mentioned before, segmenting journal entries. If you think about the three major types of manual journal entries, you've got your estimates, your automatable, and the ones that you can eliminate. The estimates are going to continue because you're going to need to be estimating bonuses and other reserves and accruals. So those will continue. It's a matter of how fast you can get them done. On the automatable side, then obviously you can subcategorize into either an allocation entry and into company, a manual adjustment to fix something that was wrong, or a reclassification. And working those automatable entries down to a small size will help you. And then finally, there's the eliminate section where you have entries that might be too small, matter on an aggregate basis and fixed in the subsequent period, or entries that just don't have any impact overall on the reporting, is to get those removed over time so that you should be limiting your manual entries to those that are purely estimate-based, which obviously you won't be able to get around automating. So analyzing those as part of your close post-mortem is a key way to make sure that you're going to not only improve the close, but eliminate some of those manual entries. Grant Fitzwilliam, co-founder and managing director at 3C Insight. Many thanks indeed. That brings our four chapters to a close. If you would like to find out more about 3C Insight, do go to their website, which is uh, 3cinsight.com. Thank you and goodbye.